Good evening. Uh, I'm Ed Byrne, uh, President and Principal of King's College London, and it gives me very great pleasure indeed to welcome you all to this, this evening to the third and final lecture in this third series of King's Lectures, the major lectures of our university, entitled The Biomedical and Health Revolution. It is now more than seven months since we held the second lecture, and I'm happy that we're able to deliver this third and last lecture, even if we can't, unfortunately, have a big audience in the room. I would like to especially uh, thank our host this evening, the Francis Crick Institute, where we're, we are recording the lecture, and welcome both a small group of scientists from Crick, as well as everyone, uh, very many of you, who will join us online. Of course, uh, our distinguished speaker for this series is Sir Robert Leckler, who at the end of August of this year stepped down as Senior Vice President and Provost for Health at King's and Executive Director of King's Health Partners Academic Health Science Centre after some 15 years uh, at the university. He will be staying on to serve these organisations in an advisory capacity and of course will remain heavily connected to the life sciences sector at the interface between academia, healthcare and industry where he's already had such incredible impact. Those of you who have attended one or both of Robert's previous lectures, either live in the lecture theatre or afterwards online, we'll be looking forward very much to this evening's lecture and the panel discussion which traditionally follows the third lecture. Our concept in the King's Lectures is one of allowing uh, time uh, from a distinguished uh, individual to develop arguments with a unifying theme beyond that that can be developed in a single lecture. After looking back in the first lecture and looking in in the second, it is time for a lecture titled Looking Ahead, More of the Same Will Not Suffice, in which Robert will discuss how we can achieve affordable health, ga health gain for all, a topic now, if possible, more relevant than ever. Uh, in the format, Robert will speak for about 35 minutes, and he will then be joined by our panelists, who he will introduce in more detail, Chris Whitty, Chief Medical Officer for England, Hugh Taylor, Chair of Guy's and St. Thomas's NHS Foundation Trust, uh, Jennifer Dixon, Chief Executive uh, of the Health uh, Foundation. Uh, I, and I think we may be joined by Richard Douglas, Deputy Chair of NHS Improvement Board, uh, but that's not certain. So please join me in welcoming our incredibly distinguished speaker, uh, a wonderful colleague uh, to many of us, uh, an inspirational colleague to me, uh, for the third in this 2020 series of King's Lectures, Professor Sir Robert Leckler. Well, good evening, and uh, thank you very much, Ed, for those characteristically generous remarks uh, and for your friendship over many years. Um, can I say at this point also a huge thanks to our four panellists, and I hope it will be four, at the moment it's three, uh, really busy people, um, for taking time out to join me. Thanks squared, I think I must say, to uh, our Chief Medical Officer, Chris Whitty, who's been under intense pressure, sustained pressure for months, and we're extremely grateful, Chris, for what you're doing for all of us uh, and the way you're managing uh, this conundrum. Um, I hope that the next hour and a half will be a little bit of light relief from uh, COVID for you. Um, can I add my thanks to Ed, for, uh, to, to the Francis Crick Institute for hosting this. It's really great that you allowed us to do this from this uh, wonderful venue. Uh, finally, penultimately, sorry, thanks to Anna Liv, who's in the audience, uh, who's organised these lectures brilliantly, uh, done it from Sweden half the time, but made everything happen. Uh, and finally, a very special thanks to a colleague and a friend, Tom Fouts, who's worked with me on all three lectures, and his support and input has been absolutely invaluable. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, so, the title of this evening's uh, lecture is Embracing Emerging Innovation While Creating Sustainable Healthcare, uh, More of the Same Will Not Suffice. So, if I can dip back briefly to the first lecture. Uh, um, as Ed said, the first lecture was looking back, and I 
zoned in on 10 medical advances that have changed the world over the last century, looked at the historical context and saw what lessons we could learn from those advances. Uh, the second lecture was looking in and I focused on some of the most fertile research areas that I think have the potential to change the face of healthcare uh, in the next decade or two. I also shone the spotlight on some things in our research world that in my view are not going quite right. So I talked about the danger of fashion in science. I talked about the challenge of reproducibility or irreproducibility. And I also talked about our research culture and how we need to take more steps to make sure it's really diverse and inclusive and that we have less of a culture of bullying and harassment, which still unfortunately is alive and well in too many quarters. But the first two lectures were largely designed to be mood enhancing. Um, but I did say at the start of the series that the lectures would get progressively challenging. And so this evening, I am focusing very deliberately on a challenge. And the challenge arises because we have two emerging realities that currently are on a collision course. Unless we do something to avert that collision, uh, patients will lose out, the population will lose out, and UK PLC will lose out. And I think we all agree that health and wealth are linked. So this is altogether a problem that we need to solve. Now, the first emerging reality is something that everybody, I think, is very familiar with. And that is that our healthcare costs are out of control. So this is uh, year by year, the cost of our healthcare system starting back in the decade. I was born uh, below 15 billion, now at 150 billion. This, the blue line is percentage of GDP, and if you consider the fraction of the public purse spent on health, it was 11% in the 50s, it's now up to 30%, and these numbers, unfortunately, are all rising. So the current uh, facts, well, not quite current, a few years ago, was the NHS cost was 106 billion, uh, the care costs about 20 billion, and I would just make the observation that I think in the future, we probably need to shift the balance somewhat from the left to the right of this slide. And how we're going to do that is not clear financially. Now, a part of the problem is the drug bill. So the drug bill uh, also continues to rise. And I'm afraid the offending uh, party here is the hospital sector. And that's the reddish bits of each of these histograms where the costs just go on going up. Now, along with the rising costs, of course, you'll also be aware that there's rising demand. So on the left-hand side of the slide is shown the costs by age group of healthcare. So for 30-year-olds compared to 65-year-olds compared to 85-year-olds, the costs escalate markedly with age. And of course, that's coupled with the fact that our population is aging. Now, in a sense, that's a sign of success. However, it comes uh, with complexity and a burden. So back in the mid-70s, uh, around 13% of the population were over 65. By 2040, it'll be 25%, a doubling of the over 65 age bracket. And with age, of course, comes the problem of multimorbidity. So when healthcare is attending to the needs of people under the age of 40, it's largely dealing with people with a single disorder. But if it's dealing with people over the age of 70, it's usually dealing with people with several disorders concurrently, and the complexity of care is substantially greater. Next slide, please. Now, I can't talk about the challenge without referring also to inequality. But before I do that, this is a slightly depressing statement, but for all the gain in life years, we've not seen a parallel gain in healthy life years. So unfortunately, as things stand, people can expect, expect to spend more of their lives in poor health. Also, slightly depressingly, uh, life expectancy has stalled and indeed declined slightly for the poorest 10% of women in the population. But the real scandal, the inequality problem, is that the health gap between the rich and the poor has grown over recent years, and that's really something indefensible. Here it is shown graphically, uh, and on the scatter plots, you've got uh, years of healthy life plotted against level of deprivation. Uh, unfortunately, my pointer seems to have stopped working. I don't know if anybody can help me to restore. 
Ah, oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, so this is unfortunately a linear relationship. So as your levels of deprivation uh, increase, so your years of healthy life decrease. And it's true for men and it's true for women. Now there's also, as again I'm sure you're aware, there's a regional uh, dimension to this inequality. So that a man born in Hull uh, has a life expectancy of around 76 and a half years. A man born in Hart in Hampshire, in Hampshire has a life expectancy of 82 and a half years. And that has a local dimension to it as well, even here in London. So you may have seen this before, but this is looking at the Jubilee Line. And if you travel from Westminster to Canning Town, you, it, as a man, you lose roughly one year of life expectancy for each stop on the Jubilee Line as you go east. These are indefensible inequalities. Now, layered on top of that, I talked about the aging demographic, but there's another dimension to this demographic that I think is very important to bear in mind, and it's something that Chris Whitty uh, has drawn attention to very eloquently in recent years. And that is that aging is not entirely even across the geography of, of the UK. So this color coding, the darker the blue, the older the population, the lighter the younger. And what you can see is that cities are getting younger and the rural communities are getting older. And if you fast forward to the 2040, this is even more exaggerated. Now, the reason that's important is that now layered on top of age on the left is the journey time to access healthcare in our current healthcare system. And you can see that the, those in most need of care have the longest journey time to access it. So as we think about solutions to address all these challenges, that's an important one to bear in mind because currently the system is not well designed to deal with this. Now that's one emerging reality. What it's colliding with is a second emerging reality that was the focus of my second talk. And that is something to celebrate and that is that we're enjoying a period of unprecedented discovery in biomedical research. Uh, Take the field of genomics, paving the way for gene editing and gene replacement. Precision medicine is absolutely beginning to gain traction, particularly in cancer. Our ability to manipulate the immune system is taking some cancers that were untreatable and rendering them treatable, if not curable. Uh, the other aspects of immune manipulation are being able to turn the immune system off in some autoimmune diseases. So these are immensely exciting advances, but the unfortunate truth is that very often turning these discoveries into drugs that enter the clinic comes with a hefty price tag. So if you compare these new drugs, so-called advanced therapies, which are biologic cells, genes, and gene-modified cells with conventional small molecule drugs like a statin, a statin, and some of you may be taking statins, costs about eight pence a day. These other drugs, and I'm not quite sure why they always have unpronounceable names, and it did occur to me that maybe the police force should adopt these as a test of sobriety. So on a Friday evening, would you like to join me on the pavement, sir? Instead of breathalyzing you, can you pronounce this word? It would be a good test of sobriety. This is trastuzumab. It's a treatment for breast cancer. That costs 6,000 a month. Pembrolizumab, 84,000 per patient. A cystic fibrosis drug, $300,000 a year. Gene therapy for eye uh, retinal disease, 600,000 a patient. And then this is the most unpronounceable of all, Tisagen Leclucel. It's a CAR T cell, a mod genetically modified T cell to treat leukemia, 280,000 pounds a patient. And I stand guilty as charged because the spin out company that ar has arisen from the work that Giovanna, my wife, and I have done over the last 20 years, Quell Therapeutics, is hoping to use CAR T cells to turn the immune system off. So, currently, how can our system, our healthcare system, adopt these therapies that have such potential when it's creaking on the border of sustainability. So the challenge that I want to confront is escalating costs, increasing demand, increasing complexity and unacceptable inequalities colliding with unaffordable innovations that have substantial, substantial potential health benefits. And that's the reason for saying that more of the same will not suffice. So simply carrying on, doing what we do now, trying a bit harder, doing more of the same, I think is not going to allow this collision to be avoided. So I want to spend the remaining minutes talking about potential solutions. And my hypothesis would be this, that if we can introduce in a coordinated way a suite of interventions, then I think we have a hope 
of creating a much more productive and sustainable health and care system that will allow us to afford these advances. So I emphasize this coordination, though having said that, the first of these interventions, curative therapies, is categorically somewhat different and maybe stands alone. Let me start there and then turn to the others that need to be seen really as a suite of interventions. Now the unfortunate truth is that all, despite all the advances in medicine, medicine cures very little. So we do cure some infectious diseases, thanks to vaccination, preventing diseases and antibiotics, treating them. Note the emergence of antimicrobial resistance as a global threat. We cure the occasional cancer, and Hodgkin's lymphoma would be one example of that. And some surgical approaches uh, could be referred to as curative. But other than that, we either wait for people to get better, or we help people live with their long-term condition. And I think we need to up our game and raise our ambition. We should be generating more cures. And I'm going to highlight three areas where I think there is real hope of curative therapies. The first is in the field of regenerative medicine. And I'm not talking here about injecting stem cells of various kinds into various tissues. I'm talking about endogenous organ regeneration. And uh, as you probably know, many chronic diseases are caused by the irrecoverable loss of cells. It applies to heart failure, it applies to dementia, diabetes, retinal disease, hearing loss. All of these are tissues that cannot repair themselves, and we are unfortunately, as we age, losing cells. And of course, in terms of heart failure, when you have a heart attack, you lose a, something like a billion cardiac myocytes, and the heart can't repair itself. It replaces that damaged tissue with a scar, and scar tissue, of course, is very poor at pumping. Now, in case you haven't heard this before, your fact for the day is that the heart muscle cells that you're dependent on now to keep your heart beating away as you sit there are the same heart muscle cells with which you were born. They have not increased in number. So you may say, well, why did my heart get bigger from when I was a baby to when I was an adult? The answer is because the cells themselves got bigger. It wasn't that they divided. So heart muscle cells cannot divide. Now, the work of Mauro Jacca, who joined King's about 18 months ago uh, from Italy, is immensely exciting in this regard. In my view, some of the most exciting work in regenerative medicine. So what Mauro has discovered is a means of persuading heart muscle cells to start to proliferate. So his model is to cause deliberately a heart attack. And then he's found a series of small inhibitory RNAs that he injects around the site of the heart attack tissue and that changes the transcription profile uh, of those heart muscle cells, and they start to divide to repair the defect. He's done it in mice, uh, he's done it in pigs, and he's come to kings to do it in patients. Now, if that can be made to work, and I think there's good reason to think that it may, that could, of course, be applied to other tissues. So here you can actually talk about curing a number of chronic debilitating diseases. The second area uh, is back to immune manipulation and particularly perhaps in cancer. So as I mentioned, currently we're able to treat a number of cancers that were untreatable, and that's very exciting in itself. But I think we should aim to really reach cancer cures uh, by combining therapies and uh, elaborating on these particular interventions. I also think that this ability to manipulate the immune system will have potential to turn off autoimmune disease and create tolerance and transplantation. So there's a second area. The third is using gene therapy. So there are around 6,000 human diseases caused by single gene defects. Now, of course, these are individually rare diseases, but when you put them all together, it's a significant disease burden. And gene therapy, as you probably know, is already in the clinic. And so there are now some uh, trials of gene therapy for retinal disease, delivering genes to the back of the eye. And Robin Alley, who recently joined us at King's, is one of the world leaders in that territory. Gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy, um, gene therapy for bone marrow stem cells to treat children born with, uh, without an immune system effectively uh, saving their lives, and then very exciting work with gene editing with haemoglobinopathies and thalassemia and sickle cell disease, and of course sickle is a big issue for us in southeast London. So these are extremely encouraging uh, trials in the, for, in, in the field of gene therapy, and I think that gene therapy may extend beyond single gene disorders. So that's my first challenge, that I think we need to 
up our ambition and aim for more curative therapies. So the second uh, intervention, and this is one that I think uh, is part of the suite I was referring to, is smart prevention. Now, to focus on prevention, uh, I think everybody would agree, is a no-brainer. It makes so much more sense, if it's possible, to prevent diseases happening rather than to treat them once they have happened. And the reason that this has to be an important part of our ambition is because so many uh, chronic diseases, that indeed are killer diseases, uh, are caused, or at least a substantial part of the risk, is caused by modifiable risk factors. So the color coding of these uh, bars in this histogram is the major killers, cardiovascular disease and cancer, largely in some respiratory disease. And then down the vertical axis are these modifiable risk factors. Unfortunately, tobacco is still out in front, followed by dietary risks, uncontrolled blood pressure, uncontrolled blood glucose, obesity, and uncontrolled lipids. These are modifiable factors. And so it's absolutely vital that we pursue and put greater effort into prevention. Now, in King's Health Partners, a very simple approach that we've adopted is to discuss what we call the vital five. These are five modifiable risk factors shown here. And our ambition is that with every patient contact, these risk factors are measured uh, and addressed and discussed with the patient. But my emphasis this evening really is on how technology can help this agenda move forward. And so here I'm talking about smart prevention. And I think there are opportunities now with risk stratification involving genetics, uh, environmental analysis, behavioral studies, to stratify individuals or groups, enabling targeted uh, screening and targeted in interventions for the populations that are going to most benefit. And a very recent practical example has applied to, in the context of COVID to selective screening of the most vulnerable. But it's possible with polygenic risk scores to identify healthy members of the population that are in significantly greater risk of some chronic diseases. A nice example of this in practice is a spin-out company called DNA Nudge, spun out of Imperial, led by Chris Tumazu, where, again, there's genetic analysis or genomic analysis to identify those at risk genetically of common diseases. That data is downloaded on your phone. And then as you go around the supermarket, your phone nudges you according to whether you're making health-promoting choices as you take things off the shelf or unhealthy choices. Now, uh, I won't leave the topic of prevention without making reference to a very important theme that uh, was initially probably championed by Michael Marmot, but Jennifer Dixon is another very eloquent uh, speaker on this topic, and that is uh, the social determinants of health. It's probably true that the biggest contribution we could make to population health would be if we could eradicate poverty and eradicate the divide between the healthy and the poor. But there's also, I think, a technology dimension to how we can make the city environment in which many people live or the housing that they live in also more health promoting. And I wouldn't want to overlook that, but the focus of my emphasis this evening is very much on the individual. The second intervention I want to zone in on is online healthcare. And of course, there's been an epidemic of online healthcare in the course, in the context of the COVID pandemic. Uh, and so I was talking to someone who knows about the GP world in the UK who told me the other day that prior to this pandemic, less than 5% of GP practices in the UK were dealing with online consultations. Now it's 95%. So that's been a dividend, I would suggest, of COVID. Uh, and uh, this has allowed uh, accelerated translation to virtual clinics. There were others already in this space, Babylon being a very good example, and I declare an interest here because I'm now doing some work uh, with Babylon Healthcare. Um, and this, I hope, will be coupled with shifts to patients owning their own data. So this is a trend triggered by COVID that I hope won't be entirely reversed uh, when the pandemic passes because I think it has a number of merits. What I think needs to be evaluated in this context is the extent to which these online consultations can replace all the benefits of a face-to-face -face consultation, uh, whether the context of the patient can be adequately assessed, whether mental health issues also can be addressed. So that urgently needs evaluation. 
Now, those online consultations, I think, can be supplemented with AI-assisted consultations using chatbots. And there are several major tech companies now in this space. Uh, Babylon was one who was an early enter, entrant into that market. Uh, and this can be used for initial symptom-based triage. And indeed, there's a UK government uh, chatbot in the context of COVID. Now, the advantages of this, of course, are immediate access to care, minimal costs to scale, the opportunity to rapidly triage patients to the right intervention, better use then of clinician time to focus where their skills uh, and their caring responsibilities are best exercised. Disadvantages, well, limited ability to assess the entire patient and balance treatment needs and so on. One question that occurs to me in this context is whether this AI-based type algorithm might allow us to get better at managing medically unexplained physical symptoms, a huge burden to the healthcare system, chest pain, pelvic pain, uh, headache are good examples. And it'll be interesting to see whether some of these AI algorithms are better than our current approach, which so often uh, sends people down the wrong pathway. I think staying uh, with online consultation, I think its real potential will be harnessed when we link that uh, with emerging sensor technologies. And I'm going to come to back to that in more detail in a moment. But I think combining these two will allow a step change. The fourth intervention in this suite of six is AI-enabled diagnosis and pathway transformation. And here again, I think there's enormous potential so the potential here is to accelerate and enhance diagnostics and to personalize treatment of disease. And if we intelligently automate this alongside complete redesign of clinical pathways, then I think very good things can happen. This allows earlier diagnosis, uh, reduction in waiting times, and I think we'll see a shift to local, much more conveniently placed diagnostic centers outside of hospitals. And again, this will free up clinicians to use their time more effectively. Now, this is already happening in the field of ophthalmology, for example. So there are some iPhone-based apps that allow some retinal diseases to be diagnosed. And Aravind Eye Care, and this is a photograph from them, using teleophthalmology in the remote bush regions of Africa, but substitute for that the Western Highlands of Scotland, uh, then you can see the potential for this to address the needs of people who are distant from accessible healthcare. You're probably aware of the work of Google DeepMind working with Moorfields where they've got a machine-based, uh, machine learning-based algorithm that's as good as the best ophthalmologist in diagnosing 60 uh, eye disorders. Also in dermatology, taking a photograph of the skin, putting that into an AI-based algorithm is as good as your best dermatologist. Now, King's Health Partners, we've got a very uh, busy center focused on this agenda. It's called the London Medical Imaging and Artificial Intelligence Center for Value-Based Healthcare. Now, this started out very much based around the hospitals within King's Health Partners, but with additional funding from Innovate UK, it's now extended its reach across the whole of London and indeed the whole of South East England. So there are now multiple NHS trusts, four universities, and a lot of industry partners working together uh, to, make this, uh, to make progress in this field. And it's all focused on what you might describe as the value equation, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Outcomes that matter to patients, service users, and carers above the line divided by the costs of achieving those outcomes over the complete pathway of care. And that complete pathway of care is a very important emphasis. So this AI center at King's uh, is focusing on 12 uh, patient pathways shown down the left-hand side here. I won't talk through them all. And then assembles teams of clinicians, researchers, and small companies to bring to bear these technologies to improve outcomes. And the improvements are tailored to each different pathway with a slightly different uh, ambition in each case. I'm going to just discuss two with you. The first is the stroke pathway. Now, stroke is a huge burden globally. It's the most actionable form of focal brain injury. Six million people a year die of stroke. 42 million survive. And there are 120 years of disability adjusted life years lost. And these numbers are increasing quite substantially. This is, these are increases over the last uh, five-year period. And the problem in stroke 
is that the outcomes of brain injury are diverse and difficult to predict. And so the right intervention, therefore, is difficult to choose. So what our center is doing is combining clinical data with uh, scanning data, putting it into a, a machine learning algorithm, and seeking to determine which patients will benefit from thrombectomy, thrombolysis, or which will actually might be damaged by those procedures and would be better to have conservative stroke care. And of course, this all has to be done extremely quickly because time is brain under these circumstances. So the way this works is that based on the scanning information, uh, an angiogram is developed of the brain uh, blood supply, and this is turned into an annotated vascular graph, and then you can identify where the blockage is that's been caused uh, by the lesion causing the stroke. And furthermore, if you unblock this, what benefits you'll achieve in terms of the circulation to the damaged parts of the brain. So this is allowing, as I say, a much better personalized targeted treatment, and you can see how that addresses the value equation. The other pathway I want to talk to you about is the headache pathway. As you know, headache is a very substantial burden to the healthcare system. And this first slide sets out the current typical headache pathway. So uh, a patient starts suffering from troublesome headaches, taking some time off work, eventually gets a GP appointment. The GP says, well, I think just to be safe, you need to see a neurologist. Now the target wait to see a neurologist is 12 weeks, so you can be sure it won't be shorter than that. Uh, you see the neurologist who says, just to be safe, you better have a scan. That happens four to six weeks later. That scan then is interpreted by a radiologist who then sends the report to the neurologist, who then arranges a follow-up appointment with the patient, reassures the patient in well over 90% of cases. Uh, in a small minority, of course, a lesion is discovered and that then needs urgent treatment. But the majority, large, large majority, are then referred back to the GP where they're managed through the community migraine service. So this is a miserable pathway. Uh, it takes about four to six months. Uh, you have a very anxious patient traveling this whole journey, as their family also is anxious. And a lot of time off work is uh, taken because each of these appointments means a day off work. Uh, and it's extremely unproductive. Now, I suggest to you that this pathway could be radically revised as follows that the patient develops symptoms, they go for an online consultation or even a natural language processing AI chatbot that then says, yep, you need a scan. Now, scans, scanners are becoming much, much more uh, manageable in uh, low-intensity settings. So low-field MR needs much less shielding. So my suggestion is this scanner will be in Boots the Chemist. You go along to Boots, you book your scan in three days' time, the scan is then interpreted by an AI algorithm. Uh, if there's a lesion found, you get rapid referral to a neurologist. But again, the large majority turn out to be normal. Back to the GP, back to the migraine community service. That pathway should all take place within a week, a matter of a few days. It's much better for the patient. It's much more efficient, and it's much lower cost. You could do the same thing for the chest pain pathway, but for the sake of time, I won't talk you through that slide. The penultimate uh, intervention uh, that I think is going to contribute to solving this problem is remote monitoring coupled with assisted living. Now, remote monitoring is already happening, as I'm sure you're aware. So passive ambient monitors, various kinds of sensors, some linked to uh, smartphones, activity detectors, uh, video cameras. This sometimes can then be coupled with questionnaires, online digital questionnaires to supplement whatever data is being obtained. This is then integrated uh, together and uh, leads to actions. For example, you can predict pending relapse and psychosis by combining some of these inputs along with patient reported uh, factors as well. And there's some very exciting cohort studies being led from the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience, uh, getting large patient cohorts uh, and following their digital inputs to see what signs there are to trigger uh, that, that provide evidence of an impending relapse in, in mental health or in Alzheimer's. This is a spin-out company in Oxford, which uh, is putting a sophisticated video camera into the home, which allows vital signs to be monitored uh, and transmitted to um, the hospital. Now, these sensors are becoming ever more sophisticated, and so it's now possible to monitor glucose through sweat, 
And if that's linked to a closed loop insulin delivery system, then you can get really precise control of blood sugar in diabetics. And that, of course, has knock on benefits because the complications of diabetes are then reduced. There's some very smart sensors built into medication. This is one which is an antipsychotic drug. And when the psychotic drug gets into the inter intestine, then a signal is transmitted, uh, which indicates that the patient's taken their medication. It's a good, very good compliance monitoring device. The smart contact lenses, which can now detect pressure changes in patients with glaucoma, and also some apps that give early warning of an impending asthma attack. But earlier this week, I had the pleasure of chairing an Academy of Medical Sciences forum lecture on this technology, amongst others. And our guest speaker was John Rogers from Northwestern University in Chicago. And I would say he's probably a world leader in this field. And he was describing uh, some really uh, wonderful sensor technologies. This, for example, is something that's put onto the skin. You can see it here on a neonatal baby. It mod models itself to skin contours. It's entirely flexible. Um, it's wireless, uh, it's battery free, there's in-sensor analytics, and using this kind of technology, you can monitor ECG, oxygen saturation, respiration rate, blood pressure, and so on in real time. And you can begin to understand how these sensors, I think, will allow us to manage patients with long-term conditions much more effectively at home, reducing the number of hospital episodes. Now, if you couple that with technology-assisted living, which again is a field that's moving quite fast, then I think you can see again how it'll be possible to maintain independence for vulnerable people, particularly the frail elderly, uh, improve the quality of life, and reduce care costs and hospital visits. So some of these assisted devices, of course, are not medical at all, and they're very familiar, like stair lifts, for example, or mobility aids. But there are others that are uh, getting, as it were, smarter, including memory aids, automatic food monitoring and restocking, uh, companionship aids. And if you combine that with remote monitoring, then I think you can see how that issue I was describing about elderly remote from healthcare, uh, that challenge can be met. Finally, on assisted living, of course, robotics, another fast moving field. Uh, Japan in healthcare robotics is probably a world leader and you can see that from this photograph. Um, but these robots, again, are becoming ever more sophisticated, can, form, can perform routine healthcare tasks, including taking blood, cleaning and disinfection, medicine dispensing, and then exoskeletons so that those who uh, have difficulty with walking, for example, can become more mobile. The UK government's investing heavily in the Robotics Growth Partnership, and there is an aim to place the UK at the front of this sector. So my final um, intervention, as it were, is to change the way that we incentivize the system. So currently, as I'm sure you know, the system is basically designed to reward activity. It's a fee-for-service system. So that healthcare costs are the multiple of the number of patients, the number of procedures, and the reimbursement fee. And that, of course, is what's giving rise to the problem that I outlined earlier on. For quite some time, healthcare costs tracked inflation, but from the 1980s onwards, you can see that they've outstripped inflation substantially, and that gap is getting wider. So I think what's necessary is to turn this equation round and to move towards a fee for outcome uh, approach, which immediately changes the incentives. So the fee for outcome, of course, can be adjusted according to the demographics of the population concerned. And so health, care, health outcomes and costs per patient should equal the healthcare costs. So the system, I think, needs to change so that it rewards prevention. And I'm a great fan of capitated budgets. So I think if we could allocate for Lambeth and Southwark the budget for that population of 2 million people adjusted for the local demographic, uh, then the system would be incentivized to keep people well, to keep people out of hospital um, and... Uh, the fragmentation of healthcare, of course, would also need to can go on getting addressed, and we're on that journey, but I think we've got some way to travel. Uh, and then incentives would be based on outcomes, not procedures. And my argument is that this would be greatly enhanced by embracing technology to redesign those pathways. One question that uh, is currently being addressed, and this is really for the more techie 
members of the audience, is could we build a digital twin of the health and care system so that we can then model how changing one bit of the system affects another, and the Council for Science and Technology is addressing that at the moment. So this is my final slide before turning to um, the discussion. I think we need altogether a re-engineered social health and social care system with a patient, of course, absolutely at the centre. And as I said earlier, I like to think the patients increasingly will be empowered to own their own health and indeed own their own health data. And these data will be generated from a variety of sources, mostly in the primary care setting from community-based healthcare. There'll be data generated from remote monitoring. Now that remote monitoring doesn't only accumulate data, it also is capable of giving feedback to the patient to encourage healthy behaviours in their own lifestyle. And this data also, of course, will be connected with secondary and tertiary care centres so that when there is a need for a hospital episode, um, then it will be part of a pathway, but the same pathway will easily get the patient back out of hospital as it did coming in because the whole system is a great deal more integrated. So that is uh, my proposition. Um, and we're now going to turn to a panel discussion. So before I invite the panel to come up and join me, some of the questions that I think we could usefully discuss uh, with the panel and indeed with those uh, online are, do you accept that the interventions um, that I've outlined in aggregate, in an integrated system, uh, have the potential to address the sustainability challenge? Secondly, what are the challenges for implementation? Because I wouldn't belittle those at all. Thirdly, who's at risk of being left behind and to what extent is, could these technologies widen health inequalities? What workforce changes are needed if we're going to really uh, develop a workforce to adopt and adapt to these changes? And finally, should we not have the ambition to reduce the hospital footprint by 20% in 20 years? So, could I now invite uh, my colleagues to come up here and join me on the stage um, and I'll invite them first to reflect, and then we'll open it up uh, to questions from the audience. Chris, uh, Jennifer, and then Hugh. Wonderful. Now, I suspect these um, panel members don't need much introduction to you, but I will briefly introduce them. So, starting on my far right, um, so Hugh Taylor uh, has had a, a long and distinguished career in the civil service, including senior roles in the Department of Health, uh, the NHS Executive, the Cabinet Office, and the Home Office. Um, he's currently the chairman of Guy and St. Thomas's NHS Foundation Trust and of King's College Hospital Foundation Trust, uh, and a key member of the King's Health Partners leadership. Uh, Jennifer Dixon, immediately to my right, um, is the Chief Executive of the Health Foundation, a large independent endowed charity in the UK. She has a background in medicine, research, policy analysis on population health and healthcare for over 20 years. And then on my immediate left, a uh, rather familiar flanking figure on these platforms uh, is Professor Chris Whitty, um, who's Chief Medical Officer for England. He is an epidemiologist and was Professor of Public and International Health at London School of Hygiene before becoming CMO. He is still a practicing uh, physician at University College Hospital and the Hospital for Tropical Diseases and the Gresham Professor of Physic at Gresham College. So thank you so much again uh, for joining us this evening. Um, so I'm going to start off just by asking uh, each of you in turn just to share your immediate reflections uh, on the things that I've said, um, and then we'll open up to a wider discussion. So perhaps, Stu, can I start with you? Oh, thanks, Robert. Um, gosh, well, first of all, uh, a really fascinating uh, presentation and um, lots of uh, great content there, which I, which I fully endorse. Um, I'm just going to enter three notes of potential caution. Uh, the first is to say that I think the affordability challenge uh, if we're thinking about this in national terms, goes two ways. We hear a lot about sustainability of the healthcare system, but affordability at national level is a subjective term. And uh, in fact, as a country, 
we spend proportionately less of our national wealth on health than does almost any other equivalent uh, uh, rich country in the world. And I think that that's something we need to think about very carefully going forward. I, I don't think that doesn't mean we don't have a sustainability challenge. I'm sure we do. Uh, but uh, I think we are increasingly this country expecting European levels of social provision, which includes our National Health Service, uh, at American levels of taxation, and that isn't going to work. So I think we have a, 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 a challenge to face as a nation. Uh, and my own view is that people will vote for more spending if it's targeted towards improving the health of the nation. Uh, the second uh, challenge, I think, is one you've already raised, which is that my experience in the Department of Health, and no doubt Chris and his team are now handling this much better, but most of the initiatives that we sought to pursue to improve health, as opposed to health services, it always demonstrated that they ran the risk of widening health inequalities because they were seized on most effectively and most consistently by people from the wealthier end of the population. And I think in taking forward all these very uh, exciting ideas that you're putting forward, particularly around technology, uh, without falling into the trap of assuming that older people won't use technology uh, and so on. But I do think we have to be very, very careful in evaluating as we go along what impact all those things are having in terms of inequality and access to that kind of technology from people who at the moment already have difficulty accessing our health care. And the third challenge is I would be very cautious myself about going health for the, ever for the kind of uh, uh, re-incentivised health system that you're talking about, not least because um, uh, uh, in terms of, for example, capitated budgets, certainly at their current levels, because we're already not affording the uh, volume of what you described as procedures. Uh, we're already queuing people and have done consistently in this country for years. We're not meeting demand for current uh, health care uh, 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 provision. And uh, at the moment, the move towards capitated budgets is simply, I think, going to ration further access to, the kind, to hips, knees, and other uh, uh, repair work that we need to do for people. So I am cautious about that. I, don't, I, I, I think it will work in certain areas and not necessarily for all. So um, uh, maybe I'm an old fogey on that subject, but uh, 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 hosp I don't really like the term hospital used, bland, uh, used sort of universally in this context because what hospitals do is provide a home for a very, very wide range of multidisciplinary staff who offer uh, access to specialist health care for a very wide range of our population. I think thinking about how we make that care available to people in different ways in the future is exactly the right task, uh, but um, I'm a little bit sceptical uh, about some of the rather, I think, simplistic approaches which are being proposed uh, for shifting care from one sector to another. Jennifer. Thank you, Robert, and thank you very much for your lecture, which I very much enjoyed. And I'm very pleased you changed the slide from the, pi from the panel of Muppets, uh, because <laughs> being a panellist, uh, that didn't look too good, but uh, thank you. So, um, so maybe I, I just want to make three sort of probably more provocative points. Um, so if the central challenge is, uh, is care sustainable into the future, um, I think that there are a lot of reasons to be cheerful. And, uh, for example, uh, the NHS I started in policy analysis um, actually 30 years ago, and uh, then there were massive and rabid discussions about the sustainability of the National Health Service. Could we afford it? Lots of discussions about rationing. We had to make hard choices, et cetera, et cetera. That went away with the Blair years because we had a lot of funding. And then after that, we had a decade of austerity. But the rationing talk did not come back in the same, in the same way. At the same time, over that period, there's been massive public support and staff support for the NHS. And if you look at the OECD international comparisons that Hugh was mentioning, sure, we are in the middling end of the uh, um, OECD average in terms of um, dollars per head, uh, and performance is also middling. So you get what you pay for, actually. It's, it's not 
good or bad, it's in the middle. Uh, although if you compare ourselves with Western European countries, we are at the lower end of the spectrum in terms of performance and certainly in terms of dollars per head. So anyway, that's one. Uh, it's, it, it is a sustain, it's, it's, it's sustained itself despite all these discussions and pressures upon it. It's also changed considerably over the last 25 years. We've actually, you asked about the bed base, but actually the NHS has lost um, about 50% of its beds in, over a period of 25 years. And it's done that incrementally uh, because of latest advances. Uh, and actually, the other thing about the change is that we see, we published today a report which looked at the volume of activity the NHS carries out, uh, has carried out over the last 20 years. And what we find is that the uh, volume has doubled over that period. Uh, the bed base has halved, uh, but actually only a quarter of that increase has been due to population aging and changes in population size. So a lot of the change is within our grasp to direct and change. Productivity is, has, has actually surpassed the, the, the general economy. Um, we have room for ri raising taxes, just as Hugh says. We can control costs in this country, probably rather too well, because we are on the low, and, and we have a financial physiology that allows us to do that. We can move fast when we need to, as we have seen in the pandemic, lots of fantastic innovations. Uh, again, uh, we published a report on that. And with the Health and Social Care Act, which was highly unpopular in 2012, the NHS itself is now at arm's length. Uh, at least it, it can set its own strategy to an extent with the long-term plans moving ahead. So that's one set of things. To speed up, the, the second set of issues is that I suppose the question on the horizon is not is it sustainable or not. It's just are the kind of challenges upon our health and care system uh, somehow having a step change? Uh, are, are we expecting a step change because of the crowding in of new technologies that are synergizing and adding to costs? Is there a step change in the uh, demand or ill health that our population is going to face? And is there a step change in something else like public support on the horizon that really could be an existential threat to sustainability? And I'm not sure whether that's the case. And um, probably the ability to pay question is, in, is, is, is stressed more because of the 360 billion that the, this pandemic is costing. So the, so the question is, is, is the future clutch of issues really fundamentally different to the ones that we've had to face and successfully deal with over the last 20 years? So final clutch point is that um, that may, doesn't mean to say I or we are complacent. Uh, we know about widening. If we really want to improve health of the population, we should really go right upstream, actually devote probably less to healthcare and devote far more to the wider determinants of health of the type that Robert was mentioning uh, that really injure our health and erode the health fabric of the population at a very early age and, and, and then reveal disease and illness earlier and chronic disease. Um, we need to really also think about how politically we're going to tackle social care reform and support people there. Um, the question on the table is, particularly for the scientists, I suppose, is do we have a strategic approach to investing in innovation in the future to, uh, to in make sure that some of our investments are in productivity enhancing technologies that can reduce our need for staff in future that are the highest cost part of the, of the health service? And I suppose the, f the final point is, um, are we going to invest in longer term proper planning for the resources that we're going to need in future rather than live hand to mouth, which is what we've been doing with year long. And, and I also, if I can just have one last plug, uh, uh, today we launched the um, research and economic for analysis for the long term centre that Health Foundation's funding, which is indeed going to be a kind of OBR for health looking at long term demand and supply needs for the National Health Service. This our biggest industry in Britain. Uh, which doesn't have this at the moment. So reasons to be cheerful, don't be complacent, and I'm not sure that the existing ex the threats on the horizon are existentially going to push us into unsustainability. Chris. Uh, well, Robert, I mean, thank you for an absolutely uh, fantastic lecture, scanning an enormous range of ideas. Uh, and I'm just going to pick up on a couple because I'm sure we'd want to get to questions. Uh, the first is, you, you mentioned multimorbidity, the fact that uh, as time has gone on, and this is going to continue to be the case for the foreseeable future, people are moving increasingly from a, a place where they either have no illness or no serious illness to multiple serious illness for a reasonably prolonged period of time. 
And we're doing that, and that, is, that future is laid out by a report in the Academy of Medical uh, Sciences that you, you're the president of and we're very heavily involved in. Uh, and I'll make two points about that. The, the first of those is that this greater uh, multimorbid future is happening at a time when the medical profession and indeed many of the other healthcare professions are increasingly specialising and subspecialising. And those two graphs do not make sense. So we have got to get to a place where we are simultaneously celebrating the fact that specialists can do things that others can't because of the fact they do them repeatedly, but also people maintain substantial generalist skills, meaning that they can manage several different things together. And then the, link, the linked thing to that is I think we should not see multimorbidity as I think it is sometimes seen as a random assortment of diseases that happen to hit people. They, they very much cluster around particular risk factors. They might be biological, uh, genetic, or, or, uh, or behavioral, uh, or they might be social, uh, or they might be around things like smoking. Uh, and if we can think of the clusters, and this is an area where AI, I really think, does have a substantial role, because one thing it is very good at is, uh, is pattern recognition. It's not quite as good at some of the things that people claim for it, but it is good at that. Then I think if we could identify the clusters, then we would be in a very strong position to be able to design medical nursing and other training around those uh, and make it much, much easier for us to treat uh, and manage uh, the chronic conditions that tend to make these up. So that's just, uh, that's the first uh, point I wanted to make. Uh, and, and then the second uh, one uh, I wanted to make was on, on the uh, curative side. Uh, I, I'm, because I'm an infectious disease person, I come from one of the bits of medicine where actually we expect to completely cure quite a large proportion of the uh, diseases we come across in relatively short order. Uh, but things can come back, uh, and some things are, you, you never get rid of. Uh, and I think the way to see this is, is not that a cure has to be forever. It just has to be till you're dead. So if we can move things beyond the point where people are actually likely to have died, shift them in terms of time to the right, then you're, in, then you're fine. It's not going to cause them any problems at all. So a cure can be a temporary cure as long as it lasts you up to the point you would otherwise have meet, reached your natural lifespan. And I think that also applies to much of the way we should think about prevention, including prevention of multimorbidity. We should be trying to shift stuff in time to the right. It's not we're trying to prevent them because eventually they will happen, but you can shift them sufficiently to the right that people never got bothered by them because by the time you know, they would have hit them, they would have been 110, and they haven't reached 110 because it does look as if, at least at this point in time, there's something of a biological hard stop somewhere between 90 and 100 uh, for the great majority of people. So I think we should be thinking about it uh, in those ways. And my final point is around technology. I think technology is at its best when it allows less trained people to provide better care. It is at its worst when actually it requires greater and greater training and more and more specialist areas. So an example of this, for example, might be uh, the technology to, that uh, enables us uh, through cardiac Dopplers to do diagnoses that would have taken decades of, of training for a cardiologist can now be done by someone who is still highly trained but uh, in a much a shorter period of time and with a much greater degree of reproducibility. That kind of approach uh, to technology, I think, will help free up resources. If it requires greater skill to use it in the future, uh, then I think it will actually do exactly the reverse. Yeah. My one caution is the one that, uh, that Hugh made. Uh, there is already, we know, digital poverty and a digital divide. There is already uh, a, a serious problem with um, many groups based on many different things, including language, including uh, poverty, uh, being excluded from the ability to have access to things like computers and smartphones. And we do need to make sure we do not build our entire system predicated on the fact people have those technologies and can use them. Uh, but I, I, I know you know this. I'm just mm. stating an obvious point. But I thought it was an absolutely brilliant lecture. And I think yeah. on behalf of all of us, thank you very yes, much. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. Um, so uh, we're going to take some questions uh, from people feeding questions in online. And Tom is sort of mediating those. Um, I'll come to those in a moment. So um, just to play back, I think on, on my right, Hugh and, and Jennifer are saying I'm exaggerating the problem. It, it's all right, really. We'll just spend more. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll get there, because we always have. Um, I. I would, I would dif disagree with you. Um, I think that is too complacent. I think that 
when I look at the way we do things, I think it's deeply unproductive and inefficient. And that headache pathway is maybe a caricature. But I think uh, if you take the way that we manage frail elderly, I don't think that they should be uh, in hospital nearly as much as they are. And I think if there are ways we can uh, manage these pe people at home in their own environment, I think their experience would be a great deal better. And I think we can use clinician time better because, picking up Chris's point, I think some of these technologies absolutely will allow other professionals to do their job and then people can operate, to use the language, at the top of their license. So um, I, I, I accept that we don't spend enough and we should spend more, uh, and maybe I suspect we will, but I don't think that the uh, demand will, uh, will, will decline sufficiently to allow us to meet it doing our current thing. But um, other views, please uh, feed them in um, online. We've got a question um, for the panel. Uh, will this initiative lead to further north and south divide? Um, I don't know any, any observations in relation to uh, the north-south divide from any of you. I, I'm sure this is something you've thought about a lot, Jennifer. Yes, well, uh, as you were saying in your lecture, Robert, the north-south divide is... Um growing well the, the 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 wealthy the people living in wealthy areas people living in the least wealthy areas that divide is is growing um stalling of life expectancy particularly in those living in the least wealthy areas but also those in the least wealthy living in the le least wealthy areas in the north of england um are wor are worse off and getting worse off than those living in the least wealthy areas in the south of england which is quite an interesting geographical phenomenon um, I, think, I think the question was about, are these things, what you were saying, going to add and uh, to aggravate that divide? It depends what you think is driving that demand. And it could well be, and I believe, that actually the bulk of that divide is driven not by differences in access to care or cure potential, but actually to these wider determinants of health that are affecting and eroding health at a much earlier stage, which means ultimately, I think, more of an economic issue than, than, a, than a medical issue. Um, so I think the, the last point I would say is that if we do devote more and more to the NHS and to, to the care and curative system, um, and we don't raise taxes, um, then we will not be able to fund some of the welfare benefits uh, or the welfare um, fabric that is needed to support the most vulnerable, which may have a bigger impact on their health. So there are reasons to, to modify what we do and, and to think harder about sustainability in the way Richard, uh, Robert is saying, simply to protect these wider determinants that are really truly affecting health more than anything else. Any other comment on the geography of our... Well, I think that only we should not assume that the geography of ill health is fixed. And uh, because of the internal migration, uh, particularly uh, of people as they grow older, uh, the, there will be an increasing bur burden of disease. I mean that in an epidemiological sense, uh, in parts of the country which actually historically we might have seen as relatively having healthier outcomes. Uh, and uh, because uh, of improvements in cardiovascular health, which is one of the huge successes, actually, of the last 40 years, uh, that will actually decrease some of the d disparities that we're currently seeing in some parts of the country. So the geography of health, ill health in the UK has always moved around, uh, and it will continue to move around. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, the disparity along grounds of deprivation, that is always been true, and that, in my view, always will be true. So where there is deprivation, ill health will always be more uh, prevalent. Mm. We have a question from the audience, Charlie Swanton. Robert, thank you very much for a fantastic lecture and to the distinguished panel for being here tonight. Um, so uh, I agree with pretty much everything you've said tonight, Robert. I think it was outstanding. I, I guess the one thing I would slightly disagree with you on is, is our progress in cancer. Uh, I think we are curing many more patients than ever before. And I think the key to this, obviously, is early diagnosis. And for early diagnosis to work successfully, we need screening programs throughout the United Kingdom that are more ambitious than ever before over the next 20 to 30 years. And that's going to need huge investment in diagnostics, MRI and CT scanners, particularly in endoscopy suites. And I think we do lag behind the OECD, other OECD countries, in the number of MRI and CT scanners per head of the population. 
So I would argue we need more investigations rather than less to catch those tumours earlier, to get to the point, to your central point, I think, which is living well and living longer, not living with a chronic illness like metastatic cancer where, where survival is measured in months or short years. That was my first question. The second question is around the link between GD, percentage of GDP spend on healthcare and its link to innovation. So if you look at the US where you have, you know, 16, 17% of GDP spent on healthcare, which is clearly outrageous and unsustainable, you have a very vibrant biotech and, and, and pharma community with innovation that helps feed forward into the life sciences industry. Um, I don't think you can totally uncouple the two, and I'm wondering what your views are on both those issues, really. Um, so I'll invite my colleagues to comment um, in a moment. Um, so I, I, I think, I mean, it's encouraging because, you know, if anybody would know, you would know um, how positive we should be on the outlook in cancer. Um, we, we've made huge progress, and, and I absolutely celebrate that on a regular basis. I still think there's more to be delivered from the kind of work that you and others do, some in this building. Uh, on the, the question, I mean, the US is a very interesting um, uh, case study. Um, so it's, it's got the highest spend on healthcare and it's got some of the worst outcomes in healthcare. Um, that's a very important point to make. So it's, the, the spend in healthcare is driven, and, and I'm sure some of my colleagues flanking me are more expert on this than I am, but it's driven by, in a sense, too much patient empowerment. So patients manage their own investigations. And, and back to my medically unexplained physical symptoms uh, point, uh, an awful lot of things get investigated extensively before realizing that actually the problem was anxiety. And that's probably doubled uh, in the US, I suspect. And then, of course, you've got the effects of uh, the insurance system and litigation. Um, but I don't think I see a connection between the healthcare spend and the life sciences sector. I think these are two, in my view, these are two unrelated things. Um, and can we in this country replicate, or how can we replicate uh, some of the vibrancy that goes on in Boston or in San Francisco? And I think it's happening, actually. I'm very encouraged by uh, the life sciences industry uh, growth in this country, the growth in spin-outs, the growth in SME engagement and the emergence of some clusters, and it's happening in London, I'm pleased to say, um, and it's happening also in other, in other regions. So I, I'm not sure, I, I don't see a connection there, but I, I'll ask uh, my colleagues for their observations or comments. Hugh. Um, well, I, I'm an and-and person on that, I think. Um, uh, so in my view, a vibrant life sciences sector in the UK will depend on a vibrant health sector and I think there has been a tendency for governments in the past uh, and possibly the present to see uh, uh, spending on the NHS as an overhead on the taxpayer. And I don't see it in that way. I think it should be seen as uh, part of encouraging a vigorous uh, uh, life sciences sector right at the leading edge of science, which translates research and innovation into practice uh, uh, quickly. I think that is the way to attract inward investment and I think we can see the evidence of this in the increasing numbers of technology and bio, uh, uh, biotech companies that want to co-locate uh, with clinical facilities along, alongside clinical facilities and access to patients and patient, in, patient data. So I do think uh, we need to ensure that we continue to fund a vibrant health system in this country which is capable of attracting scientists. I would add the same, by the way, in relation to the university sector. And since I think two of the potential huge advantages for UK PLC going forward are going to be in life sciences and in aspects of our research and science agenda generally, then I think the government needs to follow that. That doesn't mean just throwing money at things. I do think that what can go with that is, a, uh, is targeting of investment and some expectations created of return from the healthcare sector and indeed from the science sector more generally. But in, in general, I, I'm a bit more sympathetic to your line of argument, I think, than perhaps Robert is. I, I never talk about money, but I am prepared to talk about screening. Um, screening uh, is going to, I think, change very substantially over the next 20 years, uh, particularly for, ca for cancer, though not exclusively for cancer. Uh, and I think uh, there are several different things which obviously lead to those changes. 
Changes in the epidemiology is important. Some cancers are going up in incidence. Some, in fact, like uh, cervical cancer, will go down. And that actually may make screening less attractive uh, over time. Um, changes in what you can actually, the diagnostic technologies you've got to screening. Currently, I think it's, a, you know, we all know it's an incredibly marginal call where the screening for prostate cancer is useful. Uh, but with different technology, it, it will become so. Uh, uh, and the same will be true in, in other areas. And this is an area where I think in particular, where screening has to be done with um, uh, imaging uh, and to a certain extent with cytology, AI is going to transform this in a relatively short period of time. So this is not a far future thing. The idea that actually you should have a person reading mammograms really does not make sense when you look forward 10, possibly even five years. And the same would be true in quite a large number of other areas. The same might be true, for example, in cytology uh, scans as well. So I think there are going to be changes in technology. And then the final thing, which is one of the ones that things that Robert picked up in his, his lecture, uh, is that if we can better stratify people, we'll have some people who have to be screened at an earlier and more frequent thing because they're at high risk for a variety of biological and behavioral reasons, and other people where the rates of screening can go way, way down or even stop completely. So rather than having the entire nation screened at 50 or whatever it is for whatever the disease is, it's much more targeted around the individual. And again, the infrastructure for that is really available. Uh, the database systems are now perfectly capable of handling that in a way they weren't when screening first, uh, first started. So I do think screening will look a lot different uh, to what it did for many of the reasons that Robert picked out. Jennifer, thanks, Chris. Just a very quick point, which is about the take-up of innovation, which is what we all want, isn't it? And just thinking about the pandemic, the dramatic way that existing innovations have been taken up around the country and, and fed into clinical pathways has been absolutely astonishing. Um, and the lesson for me, and, and given the fact we, we fund a quite a lot of translation of innovations across the country in my, the foundation, is, is what has stopped this ha from happening before. Five years of innovation in five weeks is what one chief executive said to me. And some of this is just a different assessment of risk. You know, if you've got a, a crisis, you just do it and ask for permission later. So that's one thing. But another thing is actually having permissive management to allow you to try things and, and have much more scrutiny of the impact through existing data systems to allow you to course correct. So I think an, uh, uh, one issue which we won't have time to get into, but I just want to put it on the table, if we're thinking about sustainability of services in future, we cannot... Um, ignore management and how that needs to develop in future in order to help translate this, these, the existing innovations into reality. Mm. So just to come back to, uh, to, to Charlie, your point about spend on healthcare and, and, and the life sciences sector. I mean, as I said, I, th I think there's some encouraging things happening in the UK, but um, I think I do continue to worry that the NHS... Uh, even before COVID, um, and I, you know, the Academy produced a report on NHS and academia, which um, probably all the panellists uh, have seen, um, there's a real worry that the NHS is so preoccupied with firefighting and staying above water that it does not have time to allow clinicians who are research-orientated to engage in research. So uh, that's a, a, another reason, I would say, that we need to change the system to allow those who really would... Uh, contribute to the research agenda and whose job satisfaction would go up if they could do research yeah, yeah. Uh, to have time to do yeah. it. So uh, turning to another question, this is from Richard Barker. Uh, how many of the changes to new pathways and technology applications will be accelerated by the shift Robert advocates to rewarding and allocating resources on the basis of outcomes? If the answer is many all, then how to make the change politically attractive? So I sense that Richard probably agrees with the shift of incentive but um, how to make that change happen, Chris? Um, I think changing to out outcome-based uh, funding is always quite attractive until you try to work out how you measure the outcome. And that is where it tends to fall over. It it's becomes surprisingly easy to game the system. And the danger is what you do is people are then incentivized, not, not necessarily in deliberately, to uh, go for people where outcomes are likely to be good. Mm -hmm. So you need to be very careful that that, uh, that potential 
uh, perverse incentive does not happen. If you can find a way of doing that, then you actually are in a, in a strong position. Uh, but that has be, always been the Achilles heel of it as an approach in healthcare. Yeah. Just to say, there's a, a, there's, a, there's a lot of work that's been done on what I call the financial physiology in the healthcare system to get the best kind of outcomes for different kinds of care. Um, and the, the, the result is neither fee-for-service, Robert, nor capitation, but something blended, uh, because capitation has distinct drawbacks. Uh, fee-for-service has obvious drawbacks. Uh, and capitation is that you don't incentivize people to do more, they do less. And, and that's a problem. So it's an it's a area which is fraught, but the common, the, the, the bottom line is a blended payment. And it probably, whatever your blend of choice is, it doesn't suit every single service. Yeah. Anything you want to add here? Well, no, I just uh, e echo what Chris said about the difficulty of measuring outcomes. Uh, one of the questions I routinely ask at interviews for consultants is how would you measure the outcomes of what you're doing? And we very often don't get past uh, patient satisfaction uh, information, which is a pretty uh, shaky thing. So I, uh, I, I think, and on the whole, I'm always worried about incentive schemes because they do lead, as Chris has suggested, to perverse results. And anything you measure, uh, you tend to perform better in, and I you know, absolutely go with that, but it always, perver always has... Uh, perverse consequences. So I'm cautious about this. That's really all I was saying, Rob. And I think experimentation, some piloting of different approaches, I think would be would be a good thing. I'm not ruling it out. I just think we need to be. Uh, I don't think there's a magic bullet here. Is really what I'm suggesting. Okay. The next question I'm going to take is: Would you consider that in, this is a, it's an interesting challenge? Would you consider that investing in technologies can represent a threat to the staff of the NHS, namely as technologies can take over more and more on procedures or practices performed during the Healthcare Act, can we manage the eventuality of a part of the medical staff to become not needed anymore? Would it be a gradual taking over of technologies and reconfiguring the way of making use of the human resource? So that's something I hinted at, but perhaps we could explore that a little bit more. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to start on that? Yes, I mean, for those interested, there's a great book on this, which is the FT book of the year in 2017 by Daniel and Richard Suskind. I'm not related to them, so that I'm, but it was just very, very thoughtful, and it took the professions, including the medical profession, and um, uh, applied uh, thinking about what um, AI and future technologies is going to do. And the bottom line of that was that there are there are a lot of, as just as Chris was saying, there's a lot of care that is fairly routinized and predictable. And that extra technology, AI, can lead to good decision technologies that can support people who are not as well trained or as long trained as, a, as physicians. And um, they map out, as others have done, what are the key areas where that might happen. Um, and then, therefore, medicine and medics were, uh, in a sense, um, um, uh, confined more to what they call the art of medicine, where things are not routinized, they cannot be protocolized, and it's, and it's where you really do just need judgment because there's such a confluence of unusual um, things that you're dealing with as a, as a physician. And that, that actually may be more satisfying than a medical profession, which is also doing a whole lot of routinized um, um, services. So. Um, I think it is going to be, uh, I can't predict where it will, and ov beyond the obvious diagnostics and, and things that everyone knows about, but I can absolutely see a time when, um, w when this occurs, and actually it will be a good thing for sustainability. It would. It would. Uh, I, so just on that, Robert, I mean, all, all I would say about this is that this should be judged by effectiveness, and I think it will definitely, new technologies will definitely change how things are done and who does them over time. But I don't think we should, all the evidence so far is that what human beings find ever more uh, skillful ways of getting themselves involved in these processes. And part of the advantage of a better technology-driven world in health should be to improve people's jobs. And you've given one excellent illustration of it, which is creating more time for people to do research. Um, uh, and I, I think there are plenty of other examples in, 
of ways in which we could enrich the care we offer to patients by uh, enabling people who are trained specialists or generalists to be able to focus on what they do best, not on lots of routine tasks. And I think that applies across the clinical professions. So I don't think people should be scared in that sense of, of changing technology. The prizes will go to those who are, ad, ad, are adaptable to it and flexible. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to supplement this and, and then I'm Chris to perhaps draw you in. So this is a, a related question in a sense and it's a challenge that I, don't, I honestly don't have an answer to but I, 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 I do believe that uh, some pathways need to be radically redesigned. If you take that headache pathway, um, about half the average neurologist's time is taken up seeing patients with headaches. And as I say, the vast majority um, have no neurological uh, lesion. Um, but let's say you did implement the pathway that I described, the alternative pathway. Um, you've still got the number of neurologists you've got and they're warm bodies and they're employed and they're neurologists um, and you've got the hospital-based scanners. So you can't simply implement a new pathway and, and the question, this is from Reza Razavi, how can we change pathways using technology without the consequences on individual clinicians' roles in the short-term financial outlook of hospital clinical organisations acting as a break to progress? So I, I think it's a, it is a really tough one. Um, so in the areas where you think pathways can or could be substantially refashioned to make them more productive, efficient, better patient experience, and so on, Chris. How can one start the process of making this happen in the context of the living reality of this is the way we do things, these are the people we employ, and, and they're warm bodies with a job? Uh, well, I mean, I, I would start off where you started off uh, in your talk, but quite often I don't hear when I hear people talking about technology where they say the technology will be transformational. That is almost never true. Uh, a technology is a part along a very long pathway. So designing the whole pathway into which the technology fits uh, is absolutely critical. And if that's done well, and this goes back to the previous question, these two, I think, uh, go together. Um, you know, the principal aim of everything is to improve the quality of uh, life of patients and the public. But a very important secondary aim is to improve the working lives uh, of the healthcare professionals who work in the system. Mm -hmm. if, and frankly, if you have a technology that is good for patients but makes, makes them life misery uh, for the staff uh, and that such technologies do exist, uh, then their take up is not usually very good. Uh, if, on the other hand, it, makes, it takes away the bits of their job they really hate and moves them over onto things where they really enjoy, the patient contact being uh, almost invariably uh, part of that, uh, then people uh, will embrace those technologies uh, with enormous enthusiasm. But, and the but in this is that I think there are two things that don't naturally go together, uh, which is simplified pathways and multimorbidity. Uh, and if you think about it, many people in their 80s are on about 17 uh, nice pathways, all of which are individually sensible, but put together, uh, they rattle like a maraca when you talk in the, in the morning, they pick up all their pills. And that is something uh, I think uh, we need to uh, sort out. The final point uh, is one about generalism, maintaining generalist skills. Uh, the reason why some people in their 50s might feel threatened by new technology coming along is because they've only learned one thing for 20 years and they're not sure they can do something else. Mm. If you maintain generalist skills, that risk is substantially reduced. Uh, and so that is very good for patients, but it's actually good for careers. And the number of my colleagues who I meet in their mid-50s who are now bored of just doing a headache clinic, they've done it for 30 years, and they would really like to do something else. But current methods of training do not allow them to do that, uh, I think are quite depressing. And I think they've got another probably 15, 20 years of, uh, of, of working life ahead of them. So I think maintaining generalism is very good for patients in the long run. It's also good for career flexibility, which I consider a valuable thing. Yeah. So I, I'm aiming to wrap up by 7.30, so we'll take a couple more questions. Um, this one is on a well-understood problem. If we already have fundamental issues holding big digital global platforms accountable for their actions, how can we truly work with them safely in healthcare going forward? So this is sort of touching on, I suppose, the issue of liability, which is something I know that you've got uh, thoughts on. Chris, and it maybe has something to do with large data sets and privacy and security, I'm not sure. 
Well, I think, I mean, there are, two, there are several different ways you could, you could take this question. I'm going to take it in two separate, uh, separate ways. I mean, the first one is the issues around privacy, around data. Uh, I think we've got ourselves into a bit of a hole because the great majority of the public would like their data to be pooled with other people's data to improve the lives of their fellow citizens in the future. Uh, and yet, uh, we got ourselves into a place where we're really scared of the, pri the privacy con concerns, which are real, uh, and uh, these lead to lots of siloed data in lots of different places, which, if it came together, without doing anything new to the people, you could learn huge amounts. And I think we really do need to take an opportunity, and I think COVID has really demonstrated this, actually, uh, that we need to bring data sets together and uh, you know, taking account of the privacy concerns, but doing so in a way uh, which actually adds value. Uh, the second thing, which is a slightly different attack on it, but it's actually just, it was triggered by what you were saying about AI. One of the problems with uh, machine learning, from my perspective, there are, legal, there are legal issues. If something goes wrong, who's responsible? But my biggest concern with AI is very often if something goes wrong, I don't know why it's gone wrong. Mm. I can see that this thing is clearly misreading. It's clearly projecting wrongly the number of beds that are going to be needed in 20, in, in 20 days. But I don't know why, because there isn't an algorithm that sits behind it that can properly be interrogated. And that is, I think, a weakness of AI. And it, it leads to a number of ethical and legal challenges, which I think we need to think about quite carefully. Yeah. Anything else to add on that one? No. OK, so maybe this will be the, the final question before it. Uh, and one, I'll take one from the audience, and then that'll be the final one. Um, so the development of data-driven approaches assisted by artificial intelligence, machine learning, other digital technologies is gathering pace within and beyond healthcare, and I would agree with that. Patient and public involvement in the design of digital health tools is limited, yet essential for design justice based on patient needs. Is now the time to invest in building public understanding, involvement, and trust in a data-led NHS? Yeah, probably is one for the chief medical officer. Uh, well, it's a very easy answer, yes. yes. And I'll give a, a slightly longer answer, which is uh, this is something which the National Institute for Health Research, which I have the privilege of uh, heading up uh, with uh, Louise Wood, is, uh, is a, um, a uh, leader in, but there's a very long way for all of us to go. Uh, designing things and thinking about the patient or the public member last really makes no sense at all. So it absolutely has to be designed uh, with them from the beginning and with lots of different sorts of people who might be using the technology to get back to this issue of the digital yeah. divide. If it's all middle class young people who are highly digitally aware and you design it for them uh, and then actually the main use case is in people who don't fulfill those criteria, it's going to fail badly. So it's, we've got, that's, you know, working out who to involve is a really critical part of that pathway. Yeah. Um, thank you. I mean, the only extra thing I would want to add to all of that is the possibility that large tech companies who are increasingly interested in healthcare, as we know from the US and other countries, uh, might be able to use their consent mechanisms that they already have with their phones and other forms to access healthcare data through the NHS um, and because of patient consent. Um, and then the possibilities of products being developed where, uh, which are not necessarily the ones that one would develop first to address the needs of the population, but would nev nevertheless make commercial sense. So I think this is something that we need to be alive to. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of people have phones and a lot of people who may want to consent may be a more diverse population than, 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 than the ones that you were met, than, than, than the middle class, say. Uh, but on the other hand, I think that this is a, it is something on the horizon that I would think we should think about, and the possibility of that to generate demand could be quite high. But I, I mean, I completely endorse that. When I did the accelerated access review, I tried, uh, with the encouragement of, the, of colleagues and people who are inputting that, to put right up front uh, patient and public engagement as a, as, a, as a first key, and somehow that message always gets blurred, but I do think it's terribly important. That, also means thinking of innovative ways of reaching out and engaging with patients and members of the public. Um, and uh, that also means when we're looking at pathways of the kind you've been describing, Robert, there's no substitute for talking to patients. And if I may say so, going into the homes of those patients where we're aiming 
uh, when I, I'd like to take quite a lot of the people who design some of this stuff out into the homes where we're delivering care from Guy's and St Thomas's in some parts of Lambeth and Southwark, just to see the kind of circumstances in which people are actually living and what all this kind of remote technology and all the rest of it, how that would apply in that space. Not least because I think they would very often have some very good responses to it. Mm. But I do think that real engagement with the people at the sharp end of this is crucial to uh, getting it right for the future. Absolutely crucial. Final question from the audience. Uh, thank you, Rupert Beale, Crick Institute. Um, on the subject of curative therapies, and I suppose you might also include preventative therapies, topically, I suppose, like vaccines, how do you incentivize innovation in that space? Because at an academic level, um, let's say if you develop a brilliant new cure for hepatitis C, you might win a Nobel Prize, but the funding's gone after that, and the same also for human papillomavirus after the very successful vaccines. And I suppose at a commercial level, you have to recoup your costs, and if it's a one-off therapy, the tendency will to, be, to make that extremely expensive. So, so how do we get around this conundrum? <laughs> yeah. No, well, that's a, it's a very, very good question. It's a very difficult question. I don't have an easy answer for it. I, my own um, research interest for my career has been trying to promote immune tolerance uh, in transplant patients. And I remember uh, a workshop that Novartis, who were actually doing, supporting some research in this area, they organised a workshop on the business case for tolerance. It was a very contorted discussion. Uh, it was very difficult to see how their sales of cyclosporin would be sustained if we were able, with a single intervention, to induce tolerance. So I think it's tough. And I think if one switched to, in so far that one can switch to an outcome-based reward system, then it's a different matter. But as we are at the moment, which is treatment and action based, then it's difficult. I don't know if there's any insightful remarks about how to incentivize this from our panel. So, I mean, I, I, uh, I'm less gloomy. Um, scientists want to produce the best science. Uh, doctors, nurses, other health professionals wish to pet their patients to be better. So their, their incentives are absolutely aligned with this. Uh, companies clearly need to make a financial return on investment. The way that's been dealt with uh, has been varied depending which field you're in. But let's say in my own area of trade, which is actually low income, very low income settings with curative medicines, it's actually the, the, the uh, coming together of the science uh, base uh, with uh, public funding to de-risk it so, so that companies are not having to put all the risk capital up front for which they need a return on investment. They're paid for their services uh, in development where they have particular skills. So it's a, it's a completely different economic model potentially, uh, where, but it actually does lead to remarkable changes. And if you look at what's come off, off, the, uh, off the, ro the end of the roller across whole ranges of diseases for which there were no curative treatments and now there are, uh, it works. So I, I, I actually do think it's possible to find alternative models. They won't work for every, all the kind of things that Robert was talking about, but I'm just using that as an example where actually the system can work, provided you can align everyone's incentives. And uh, I think the, doctor, the, you know, the medical staff and the, the scientists, uh, things are already aligned. It's really just about sorting out the money. Okay, well, I'm going to hand the podium back, I think, to uh, Sir Ed um, in a second. I, I think it's very difficult for me to sum up. Um, I guess what I would observe is that I, I've run into some resistance and scepticism from my colleagues on the platform. Uh, there's a very reasonable view that part of our problem is we don't spend enough, and I think that's probably true, and it may well be that the public, as Hugh suggested, will accept uh, putting more of their uh, salary into a health-related tax. But I still would make the argument that that is not going to solve the problem. And if we want to achieve the productivity and efficiency uh, and patient experience of better outcomes and adopting new therapies and uh, making time for research, we do need uh, to radically redesign some of the ways we do things because I, I retain the view that they're still quite fundamentally unproductive in too many cases. But it's a very interesting discussion and I thank you for your challenge uh, and the audience... More support from your left. <laughs> Good. I, the audience uh, that I can't see, uh, you will make up your own minds. But thank you very much uh, for being with us. Ed. Oh, look, my uh, role is just to thank... Uh, everybody who's contributed uh, to these uh, lectures 
Uh, I want to start by thanking the three panelists uh, tonight uh, who've just been fantastic. Uh, we've had uh, some high-level discussion, uh, as always in a great panel, not uniform agreement, but uh, with some complex issues that's not expected, so thank you all. Uh, but thanks, oh, I just want to make one comment about the panel, um, and I didn't mean to do this, but uh, in my early years in Melbourne, I was responsible for neurology and neurosurgery services in the inner city, uh, and I worked with Steve Duckett, a great uh, health economist uh, when he brought in case mix and the various uh, WIS uh, revisions to deal with the complexity issues that uh, Chris referred to. And it pretty much worked. You know, we, we brought uh, glioma uh, inpatient time on our service for about 5 million people uh, down from about 12 days to about 4 uh, with improved clinical outcomes. So that's a little example. But Robert, I think you're onto something. Don't uh, give up on that one. Um, but mainly, uh, I want to thank uh, Robert. Uh, so Robert Leckler. Uh, he's given uh, three brilliant lectures. Um, they're all available uh, online, uh, either on the King's uh, website or on YouTube. Uh, he's looked back uh, with uh, 10 fantastic examples of things we can take pride in uh, as a medical research uh, and health uh, uh, community. Um, he's looked in uh, about where we are now, uh, and in a challenging and insightful way, he's looked to the future, and he's outlined the problems and dilemmas, uh, suggested some potential answers, and we've had a very vigorous uh, discussion uh, around that. That is exactly what uh, a trilogy of lectures is meant to achieve, uh, done spectacularly. Uh, Robert, uh, thank you so much. <laughs>